Say again, Bravo. Say slowly. Say slowly. Oh, Roger, Charlie 30 about 20 degrees to your right, 20 degrees to your right on the edge of the rail. Okay, 3-0, do you have Bravo on board? Do you have him on board? Yeah, they're about now. 3 west of Delta 30. Okay, I understand you're bringing him up, turn right, turn right, 30 degrees. The chute is off your 12 o'clock after you turn right, 30 degrees. Then the 49 and Firefly, uh, expect freak. So, Doc, can you tell us how, in, in, uh, how did you wind up in the military? How did you wind up with this group of people that, that are here this weekend? Um, I know that uh, you were up in, uh, involved in Operation Tailwind, and there's a lot of crossover between the guys, between Special Forces and the ULA guys, but can you kind of give us an idea of how that you fit into this whole picture from sure. this weekend? I was uh, in a teacher's college, 1962 to 1965, and knew I didn't want to be a teacher. So dropped out of college and knew I was a candidate for the draft. And I decided that I wanted to be the best there was if I was going into the military. I had read and researched about this outfit called Special Forces, the Green Berets, unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare, behind enemy lines. I said, that's for me. So I went to the recruiter and I said, I'd like to volunteer for Special Forces. And the recruiter looked at me and he said, son, you don't, volunteer, you don't choose Special Forces, they choose you. He said, I can get you as far as jump school, and after that you're on your own. So I threw the dice and uh, got through basic training, airborne training, advanced infantry training, tested for Special Forces and actually was selected for training. Went through medical training, was, was offered the medical, uh, the uh, occupational specialty that I wanted, and I chose medics because I thought, where could I do the most good for my country, make friends with the indigenous, and still be a Special Forces soldier? And I chose medics, and off I went. So fast forward to Vietnam. Uh, there were seven of us from my class who were deployed to Vietnam, and we uh, entered country and almost were diverted to conventional units until the Special Forces people found out that we were there in the reception station and came and got us and was assigned to A-teams, the Special Forces camps. Uh, after about a year on the A-camps, I was recruited for my course, Mobile Strike Force. Did about a year and a half on Mobile Strike Force. Went to Thailand for a year where I had a dispensary in a remote area that was training indigenous people from other areas and finally uh, went back to Vietnam and volunteered for SOG, the Special Operations Group. So with these guys, the SPAD pilots, and this reunion, it was part of the tailwind operation, which was the deepest penetration into Laos, Ho Chi Minh Trail area that had ever been done. How far was that? <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, it was about 30 kilometers in. Uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail ran parallel to the border area, uh, often crossing into South Vietnam, uh, but no attempt had been made to really bottle up the Ho Chi Minh Trail in a large effort, and uh, Tailwind was that. The uh, CIA had its uh, own troops, its secret army in Laos, and they were moving on a, a town in southern Laos and decided they needed us to block the trail for a while. Uh, thus, a B Company from Command and Control Central, FOB2, went in to accomplish that mission and got, uh, was, was on the ground for uh, four days as opposed to uh, the one day that they were supposed to be in there. Wow. Now, you came in as part of a uh, air evac mission, correct? Right. I was what they called a chase medic. Uh, when the teams were in contact and they needed to be extracted, they usually, unfortunately, had casualties. So the chase medic uh, was on the first helicopter to try to retrieve the wounded and begin treatment in the helicopter and stabilize the patient until we could get them to an appropriate medical facility. And often that meant, of course, if the team was compromised, the LZ was hot, but we went in anyway. 
So um, in that particular mission, I believe you were shot down or the aircraft was... Uh... Right. Uh, we went in to try to get the wounded out. And we were on CH-53 helicopters flown by the Marines. And they had an LZ prepared for us. And we went down and we got just above the point where we could comfortably lift the patients into the helicopter. And Mike Rose, the later recipient of the Medal of Honor for his actions in Tailwind, was trying to, to bring the patients up where I could grab them. And my junior medic had my belt as I was leaning out the ramp of the helicopter to try to, to grab onto the patients to bring them in. Uh, and it just didn't work uh, because the, the helicopter was taking so much fire that they pulled up and they pulled up very sharply. And as they pulled up in a, a particularly high angle, uh, a B-40 rocket went through the bottom of the helicopter, out the gasoline tank. And uh, we managed to limp about, I would estimate about five to 10 kilometers, something like that, and crashed into a North Vietnamese fortification complex. And thankfully they weren't there. So how long were you in the military when, when you were there with Tailwind? Um, how many days were you involved in that contact? Because I knew you came back the second time, correct? Right. I'd, I'd been in Vietnam at that time in Southeast Asia probably two, two and a half years already, uh, and then volunteered for SOG. And I was in SOG only a couple of months before Tailwind happened. And. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to survive that and go on and, and uh, continue to run the medical section at FOB2. How long was your military career overall? Active in reserve, 40 years. Wow. Started in 65 and got out in 2005. And you and I were talking earlier, you were, where were you when you ran into your Russian counterpart? I think it was <laughs> Afghanistan. Do you mind going into that at all? No. Uh, as we were flying in to Laos on Operation Tailwind, to try to evacuate the wounded and, and uh, evacuate the, the guys on the ground. We flew through some he pretty heavy anti-aircraft. And the anti-aircraft reminded me of the World War II movies, like 12 O'Clock High, where you see the B-17s flying through this ack ack that was blossoming in the air. We, we threw, flew through the same kind of thing. And we finally got in, and as I told you, uh, shot down once, and actually when we were being rescued after being shot down. The helicopter that was rescuing us was taking hits and we had to land a little bit later. But the NA aircraft was pretty heavy. So fast forward to 1997 when I had a mission in Kazakhstan and our team was actually the first American unit invited into the former Soviet Socialist Republic of Kazakhstan. And just as an aside, uh, the, the formation in the morning after we got there was very impressive because they had a band out there and our American team stood in formation and the Kazakhs stood on the other side and they played the Star Spangled Banner and raised the American flag. That's and amazing. With the Star Spangled Banner reverberating over the steps of Russia, the steps of Kazakhstan, I knew the Cold War was over and we won. <laughs> but as a part of this, this uh, affair, the, the day that we got in, uh, they were having, in the hospital complex where we were working, they had something called the best nurse competition. And this wasn't staged for our benefit, this was an annual event that the wards in the hospital would put up a nurse to do the competition and they would give them a task, a medical task that they had to do in a timed fashion, put on a ace wrap or do a sling or something. And they also had a talent. They could arrange flowers or sing or dance or something. And then they were judged and the winner would win a small appliance. And, and that was a big deal in Kazakhstan. But as we were sitting there, uh, the officers, including me, had an interpreter assigned uh, that could speak English and, and Russian. And my interpreter is a young lieutenant. And he was sitting next to me during the competition. And he looked at my uniform and my right sleeve and he said, uh, what is that patch on the right sleeve of your uniform? I said, oh, that's a, that's a combat patch. American units wear uh, on their right sleeve the unit they were in, in combat with. And he said, is, that's a special forces patch, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. And he said, were you in Vietnam? I said, yes, I was. 
Oh, uh, were you in Laos? That's a really nice competition they're having up there, isn't it? Look at that dancer. She's doing it. No, he said, no, 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 no. He said, you can tell me. And actually, the, the classification was off of, of the special project, so I could actually talk to him. So it turned out that his father was a Russian advisor to the North Vietnamese anti-aircraft artillery units that were shooting at us. And we stopped and we, we said, okay, well, where, where were you? Well, I was here. And where was your father? Well, he was stationed here. And it turned out that he was advising the North Vietnamese aircraft, anti-aircraft unit that was trying to shoot me down. Very, very small, small world. That's an amazing, amazing story uh, how when you get into the military community, we were talking about this earlier, it is a very tight-knit, small community. Yes, I don't care what side of the fence you're on. Um, there seems to be quite a bit of overlap between who was here and who was there. Well, an interesting thing currently that's happening is that SOG guys, special operations guys, who were in FOB1, FOB2, FOB3, are hooking up with some of the North Vietnamese who were actually hunting us. Oh, really? The units that were assigned to hunt us down and kill us are now meeting up with, with some of our guys who are in the POW MIA recovery teams. And they are benefiting because we can tell them some of the places we were and some of the actions we were where they might want to account for some of their missing. And they in turn can tell us where some of our, our honored dead might be. So, you know, while we have no love for the communists and probably never will, we still can get along with them as fellow soldiers it's not, it's not a large component. I mean, it's not as if we're having reunions with one another. But members of the POW MIA search teams, recovery teams, that are in Laos, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, searching for remains of our troops, are getting information from some of the North Vietnamese units, the North Vietnamese unit that used to be assigned to look for us. What unit would that, was that? Uh, I can't call the number of it right okay. now but it was uh, the, the, something called the Bintron uh, Regiment. Are they very similar to your SOG teams, very mm -hmm. special teams? They were specialized in that they would hunt for us, okay. and they were trained in tracking and, and locating us and in radio direction finding and all that stuff, that, and dogs that they needed to find us. And there are survivors that have met with, with one or two of our guys and said, okay, well, let's compare notes. And some of this is actually born fruit in finding our, our folks and bringing our POWs back. Uh, I um, excuse me, our MIA back. We were just uh, told um, recently in the news, I believe it was uh, F4 Real was just recovered and was brought home recently, was he not? And right. he was in Laos, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, any of that have any bearing on this, or was that just I, the MIA? I don't know about specific cases. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Doc, I want to thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to say? How many times did the SPADs come in when you were on the ground? Were they a multiple? Can you tell me just a little bit about your experience? I, I, I just, I was in something called a mobile strike force before I got into SOG. The mobile strike force, as opposed to the, the reconnaissance teams in SOG that were trying to stay out of trouble, the mobile strike force was looking for trouble. <laughs> we were looking for the, the North Vietnamese. And, and one of our missions was to go in and insert when camps were in trouble and, and basically take on the North Vietnamese or, or Viet Cong units that were uh, giving them trouble. But there was one operation where we were ordered, and we'd previously overrun a North Vietnamese artillery company on the move. Felt really good about that. But we were ordered to move south seven kilometers because a B-52 strike was gonna go in. And when we set up, the second day we set up on two ridge lines, which were maybe 250 meters, 300 meters apart. Uh, the North Vietnamese attacked the group on the east and killed eight of our guys. And, and we're coming through the draw between the two ridge lines to attack both of us, them from the rear, and attack us. And I had contact with the A1 pilot on the FM, and he asked what he could do, and I said, bring it down just into that small valley between us. And he did, he said, it'll take a minute. And he flew in and his wingtips were about level with me. He started his 20 millimeter run, uh, maybe three or 400 meters out, 
and just devastated those people down there who were trying to gather to, up to attack us. But as he went by, again, his canopy was about level with me, just in this small space in between the two ridge lines. He turned over and he went and flew on, and I will always remember that. The guys had, had panache as well as skill. That's amazing. Did you ever find out who that pilot was? I didn't. I talked to Roof here earlier, yeah. and he was in the area and actually, I think, worked uh, his spad for us a little bit. But he said, no, I don't remember saluting anybody. And I said, ah, just like, Would love have been to meet nice that guy. It was you. Yeah. Well, that is fantastic. I really appreciate you taking time with us. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure yeah. to do it. What does the CCC stand for? I've heard that several times. Everybody's referred to CCC. And, and they were, they were giving... In, in 70, 71, when I was there, there were three basic operational bases for command and control. Command and control north, which is CCN. Command and control central, which is CCC. And command and control south, which is CCS. North was Fubai area. Central was Khantoum. And south was Bambituit and they would all launch in different parts of the Ho Chi Minh Trail into Laos and Cambodia. Very good. Again, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Is there anything else you'd like to invest Thanks for on? the opportunity. Oh, no. Thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, two, if you've got a tally on them, uh, you can uh, get three zero. Bring him, I got your location. Bring him over to about where you are right now and stand by. Okay, Jolly, three zero. Are you in a left turn now? That's his over, dude. Are you the closest to the east or to the west? Uh, to the west. Okay, I should be about your 4 o'clock now. Understand about my 4 o'clock? Roger that.